Um, I want to introduce uh, my, my friend and colleague Sachet Grover. So Sachet um, did his PhD at IIT, uh, at, did his, sorry, did his undergraduate at IIT Delhi, right. um, and, and then his PhD at University of Colorado Boulder. And, and then moved on to, to work at National Renewable Energy Labs and, and is currently with First Solar in uh, Silicon Valley. So, um, so we, we stayed in touch through all that and, and hopefully we can um, maybe do something between our groups in the, in the future. But um, so Sachet's going to talk today about the topic that he worked on at, at University of Colorado Boulder and, and that we first got in contact with because it was something I was interested in at the time as well. And this is uh, solar antennas and collecting a new, a different way, not a new way, but a different way of collecting solar energy and converting it into electricity. So, um, and I think he'll give us a bit of an introduction to his activities at First Solar as well. So, mm -hmm. um, welcome to Sydney and welcome to uh, UNSW. Sachet, over to you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Richard. <laughs> thank you, everyone. And uh, thanks for the introduction and the opportunity to speak here today. Thanks for hosting me. And, uh, you know, I, I, I've, I found it hard to find a title for my talk because I was trying to combine so many things things that I'm excited about, things that I've done over the years. And uh, so this is the best I could come up with. But um, let me just uh, uh, briefly say that, yes, I, I, I've been really fortunate to be in the PV field and uh, to see different technologies be a part of uh, different teams. And um, starting from my uh, PhD topic at uh, University of Colorado, which was on rectennas. Um, and then at NREL, I worked on um, crystalline silicon, uh, mainly curveless, but also some uh, wafer-based. And then at Cyfinity, um, I was working on a wafer replacement for silicon technology. And uh, now at First Solar, I'm working on CAD-TEL. So a big shift there in terms of material, but not the device physics. And that's pretty much what I'm going to talk about today. Um, so let me start with an introduction to uh, First Solar, and I'm, I'm really excited to be working at First Solar. We just uh, reached the 10 gigawatt uh, installed worldwide capacity <laughs> this year, and uh, those are the different numbers you can imagine around that 10 gigawatt uh, milestone, the second company to do so other than Trina. And um, really, uh, you know, the scale uh, of installations uh, that First Solar is doing is mind-boggling. This is an aerial photograph of the uh, 550 megawatt uh, plant installed in California. And um, I haven't had the opportunity to visit one, but I, I, I'm sure uh, it, it just, it's a couple square miles, so it's, it's huge. Um, so where is First Solar in terms of efficiency today? You know, we, we announced uh, 18.6% uh, uh, aperture area efficiency earlier this year. Uh, and, you know, this is a shift from what First Solar was earlier, uh, considered a, a low efficiency product. But in today's market, as you can see on this NREL efficiency curve, uh, the First Solar CATTEL product is competing with uh, multi, multi crystalline silicon product. And, uh, and, and the roadmap looks promising. So uh, the um, advantage of the first solar product uh, really comes from a fully integrated and automated thin film process. Uh, we start with semiconductor deposition on glass and at the end of the assembly line, uh, we have the finished modules and uh, being a direct band gap material, there is a huge uh, cost advantage in terms of uh, semiconductor material reduction. Uh, the, uh, process is, uh, is in, in line and uh, we don't have to make the module separately after finishing the wafers as, as we do in the silicon product. So there are some benefits to uh, the glass in module out approach that First Solar has taken. Uh, in terms of uh, technology, uh, I think the, uh, one of the biggest sellers for the CATTEL product is the temperature coefficient uh, being a uh, wider band gap material, uh, the temp temperature coefficient uh, is smaller. So even in hotter climates at elevated temperatures, uh, the performance degradation is much less than uh, it would be for silicon. Uh, 
and, and here's just a comparison chart for different technologies that was published in 2010. So um, the, the standard test condition performance might be similar, but uh, in the field, the energy output that you would get for a, for a solar product would be much more uh, because of this uh, smaller temperature coefficient. So let me change, uh, on this note, the temperature coefficient, um, let me change gears to some of the work that I did uh, before I joined First Solar, uh, which is looking at uh, temperature dependence of VOC and uh, temperature and light intensity, uh, actually. And those two happen to be uh, very familiar to people working in silicon, namely Sun's VOC and VOCT. And what I did was, um, try to look at a method, develop a method to quantify the recombination channels that uh, are happening active in a solar cell. So the quasi-neutral region, uh, the space charge region, the interface recombination. So how, how do we kind of uh, use a macroscopic variable like VOC to uh, get down to numbers for how much recombination is happening in each of these channels. Um, so here's the outline and I'll use two examples. One is a CAGS cell. Uh, again, this was made at NREL. And the second example is an epitaxial silicon heterojunction cell. And this was uh, the project that I worked on at NREL where, where we grew, um, started with a seed layer on an inexpensive substrate and used hot wire CVD to grow crystalline silicon. I won't go too much into the technology, but I'll use those devices to show some results. So we are all kind of familiar with this uh, heterojunction band structure. Here it's a uh, p-type emitter, n-type absorber, typical silicon heterojunction-like structure. And I've marked the different recombination regions. Uh, and what we do to assess VOC is uh, use the formula KT by Q log JSC over J naught total, where the J naught total accounts for all the different recombination channels that are active in a cell. Uh, it's, uh, it's not an exact dependence. This is, uh, uh, you know, there, there's, there's an ideality factor, a fudge factor that we need to use to satisfy uh, ideality factor two versus ideality factor one recombination channels. So that's really uh, where this, um, the main drawback of this model is. So uh, what I do is, um, what I did is to relate VOC to carrier concentration rather than uh, use the, uh, the diode equation uh, to begin with. So we know that the VOC is essentially the difference in quasi-Fermi levels and the quasi-Fermi levels is related to the carrier concentration. And I define this parameter beta where beta square is equal to the prod NP product in the cell. And for constant quasi-Fermi level separation, uh, beta square would be essentially a constant. Uh, but what I can do with this is that now I can relate uh, carrier concentrations in different regions of the cell uh, to a common parameter beta and, and, um, and, and relate the carrier concentrations uh, within the different regions. So in this analysis, I would, uh, since I'm going to use the intensity and temperature dependence of VOC, I would like you to think of VOC as, as uh, a variable, as not, not, not as a performance metric at 25C one sun intensity. It depends on the light intensity, depends on the recombination. Uh, of course, there are assumptions. Uh, as with any other theory, and uh, this would break down if there's very strong recombination in one part of the cell, which would, uh, you know, essentially uh, the, the quasi Fermi level separation would not be constant with that. So, um, what, I, what I do um, here is I use the three big regions of, and remove the surfaces, the emitter and back contact surfaces. I, I, I was interested in this project to look at interface versus space charge versus quasi-neutral region. And I define uh, this SRH recombination in each of these regions, uh, add that all up, and equate that to the total generation that's happening in the solar cell. 
And uh, so here's, here's the formulas for that. Uh, as you can see here in, in the bulk, uh, I just uh, multiply the width of the bulk with the SRH recombination and get a constant multiplied by the beta square dependence uh, at the interface. Uh, this is a simplified formula for the recombination at the interface, which is uh, recombination velocity times number of minority <coughs> carriers, or in this case, actually majority carriers, because the, at the interface there are less electrons and more holes, uh, and electrons are the majority carriers in this device. So it's the majority carrier concentration that limits the interface recombination. And, and then in the space charge, uh, you have essentially both types of carriers. So I multiply with the wi width of the space charge with the uh, SRH recombination happening at the location where the P is equal to N, just as a simplification. That's a textbook approximation. Uh, so in this, uh, what I would like you to kind of take away from here is the fact that the bulk and the interface recombination both have a beta square dependence. And, um, and the space charge region has a beta dependence. And, and that's, that's really the difference in ideality factor. These two are ideality factor one recombination. Space charge is an ideality factor two recombination uh, and, and gives a beta term. So that's, if you add these all up, then uh, you get a quadratic in beta. And um, solving for that quadratic um, essentially gives you uh, VOC. So that's what I do here, and, and uh, lo and behold, get a formula for uh, VOC that depends on uh, these terms K1, K2, which are defined here as uh, these uh, strength of recombination, basically, the R0D, the R0I, and uh, those dependencies you can see here, the R0 uh, are, are, are not dependent on the operating conditions, but more uh, dependent, well, it's dependent on the temperature through the NI, but, but it, these are more material properties, lifetime, and, and doping. So that's the formula for VOC. So I, I use that to kind of fit uh, the light intensity dependence of VOC for one of these uh, amorphous silicon crystalline silicon heterojunction uh, devices and uh, get, get a really good fit there. Uh, the, what you can also do is kind of define an ideality factor with it, uh, where the ideality uh, it depends on the light intensity derivative of the VOC. And um, so here's in the red is the ideality factor. As the light intensity increases, the ideality factor goes from uh, you know, approaching two uh, to approaching one at high intensity, and that's, that's the transition going from space charge limited to quasi-neutral li limited or interface limited recombination. And again, there's a reasonable fit and agreement between the fit quantities, um, the numbers there. So that's, um, so one, one more thing that I, I, I was able to extract out of this uh, uh, analytical expression is, is this um, extrapolation of uh, temperature dependence of VOC up to zero Kelvin. And this is a technique which is commonly used uh, in heterojunction physics to uh, see whether there is interface recombination happening or not. And, and if the extrapolation of VOC to zero, zero Kelvin uh, goes to the band gap, people say that there is no interface recombination. But if it is subband gap, People say, yes, there is some interface recombination. This you know, Fermi level is being pinned, and things like that. But there's no uh, formal um, framework to explain why it should be less than band gap or how much it, will it be less than band gap. So I was able to use this formula for VOC here and uh, basically take the derivative of VOC and come up with this expression I've outlined in red, uh, which states that the activation energy, which is defined as the extrapolated intercept uh, with the y-axis at zero Kelvin, is a weighted mean of the band gap and the, surfa uh, the interface inversion uh, 
uh, at zero volts at room temperature. So let me spend a minute on this interface inversion. So uh, this is the amount of voltage VOC that is developed, and uh, whereas it, which reduces the band bending, the original band bending. Uh, let's follow this conduction band here. Uh, is is this term phi and B zero? That's the essentially the barriers that the electrons have to climb up till the interface to recombine. So. Um, so if the VOC was zero, this barrier would be the phi and B zero term, and that's what is, is used here. So, so phi, phi and B zero would be similar to a built-in voltage, perhaps, and let's say it's 0.95, and the band gap is 1.12, uh, and so the extrapolation uh, falls somewhere between those two values. So here's, here's the formula now which is allowing you to uh, see experimentally where the VOC is going depending on how strong is your bulk recombination versus how strong is the interface recombination. So you can make a separation between those two. And uh, where this really helps us to, uh, as a device physicist, is to say that, okay, you know, we need to focus on interface because that's the limiting recombination in our device. You know, those kind of analysis can be performed with this. Uh, more recently, well, let me, yeah, so this is kind of just a summary slide with those two uh, techniques. Uh, take the light intensity variation and take the extrapolated temperature dependence here. And, and from those, you can, uh, that, that gives us three quantities, K1, K2, and Ea. And basically, inverting the matrix, I can find out uh, what is the uh, distribution of recombination uh, within the cell at one sun. So for this example of the heterojunction silicon device, um, the, the, the um, dominant recombination was the space charge followed by the interface followed by the bulk. So we had a poor material to begin with uh, because we were growing epitaxially, it had dislocations. And so this is kind of an indication that yes, here's where the limitations are. Uh, we did a similar thing for the CIGS cell and um, the problem there was a little different. Uh, as, as shown in this uh, diagram here, we were varying the band gap uh, of the uh, CIGS by changing the gallium concentration. And uh, we did not see a proportional increase in VOC. This is published by the silicon, sorry, the CIGS group at Andrel uh, in 2012. And they uh, were suspecting Fermi pinning uh, as, as a cause for this, um, rollover in VOC with band gap. Uh, when we did this analysis on, on, on their cells, uh, and the data actually already existed, uh, just had to plug it in, uh, what we found out was that the ratio, so here is plotted the ratio of interface to bulk recombination. We found out that uh, for the low band gap devices, the bulk was the dominant recombination, but as we increased the gallium concentration, uh, the interface recombination uh, started to dominate. So that's kind of in line with the Fermi pinning theory, but it, here's a direct evidence, the fact that interface is limiting the VOC for those band gap values. And that, that was published in 2014 uh, in this paper. So more, uh, just, just uh, to give you a summary of you know, how the technique works, here's a, a chart showing, we're starting with uh, temperature and intensity dependence of uh, the JV measurement, uh, extract the VOC and a VOC at one sun uh, versus temperature. And you take fixed, <coughs> fixed temperature and VOC as a function of intensity, kind of perform the mathematics that I've already gone through, combined with uh, band gap values, perhaps from quantum efficiency, uh, the interface inversion from CV built-in voltage, and you can essentially filter uh, down to different levels and um, even solve for the lifetime and surface recombination velocity. Again, uh, there's certain error bars on all these numbers. Uh, if you're looking at devices which are 0.1% apart, I don't think you'll see much, but if you're looking at devices which are a few percent apart, I think these uh, the, the error bars should be uh, small enough to allow some resolution 
uh, into, into what's going on. Um, another uh, thing that I worked on more recently and published in the PVSC this year is uh, the temperature coefficient of the VOC itself. And, and we are all familiar with uh, this well-known equation uh, previously published uh, in 2003 by uh, Professor Green uh, from this university. And um, what, I, what I did was I essentially took the temperature uh, derivative of the VOC in the equation that I showed before. And I get an equation which is similar but different. Um, so here's the band gap term, which is very similar to what is in Green's equation. Uh, the VOC term, which is very similar, the gamma KT term. Um, but then there emerges this other term, which is dependent again on uh, the band bending that's happening in this device. Uh, and here I draw, um, sorry for throwing this off, but this is a, a P-type absorber now, uh, 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 more, more of a CATTEL or CIGS-like absorber. And um, this term, chi i, is uh, the distance of the minority carrier uh, band from the Fermi level at equilibrium. So that's, that's the strength of the band bending that's kind of the also reflected in the built-in voltage. This is um, essentially, I think, band gap minus built-in voltage, essentially, something like that. Uh, but anyways, so the difference here is, again, this term, uh, which is contributed by the interface recombination, the ratio of the interface recombination over the interface plus bulk recombination. So larger uh, the interface uh, recombination, uh, larger will be this term, and that's going to essentially reduce, uh, reduce the temperature coefficient. So that s makes sense because uh, now the temperature coefficient uh, or, or the VOC is not uh, purely a function of recombination. It's getting fixed by the Fermi level of the position of the Fermi level due to the interface recombination. And, 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 and that's how it affects. So let me take an example in the next slide and, and show what it does. And I rearrange the terms to kind of bring out this interface recombination separately. I take experimental values, values for VOC and, and temperature uh, derivative of VOC and plot that um, right hand side, which basically reflects the interface recombination. And I do that for the ga um, low gallium and high gallium device in the CIGS cells that I mentioned before. Uh, here's the VOC as a function of temperature for different light intensities uh, for both these cells. And if I, if I perform this uh, calculation, what I see is uh, the low gallium device shows a very small number uh, independent of light intensity uh, for and, and, and the high gallium device shows a very large number for this equation, basically saying that there's more interface recombination happening in the high gallium device, which we knew, but again, this is another way to look at the same data, another way to confirm that. So let me uh, change, uh, well, I went back. Uh, stop here and see if there are any questions so far. If not, uh, I'll move on with something that's a little more exotic, uh, the topic of rectennas. And um, this is the work I did in my PhD thesis. And the basic principle is that we treat light in terms of an electromagnetic wave instead of photons. Uh, impinging on a semiconductor. And these electromagnetic waves are received by an antenna, uh, which creates oscillations. And then these oscillations are rectified uh, across a diode. So what's the mechanism of rectification? Uh, there's um, what I'm going to mention is, is called the small signal rectification. Basically, there is a nonlinearity across uh, at any point along the di diode curves. So uh, in that nonlinearity, let's say this is the bias point. Uh, you have an oscillating voltage, which takes you up this curve and down this curve. Due to that nonlinearity, there's um, an, 
a difference in the amount of current that flows when you go up this curve versus when you go down this curve. And that essentially produces a DC signal, a DC offset in, in the uh, output that you get from this device. So that's, uh, that's the small signal uh, operation when the signal strength is much smaller than the diode switching voltage, the turn on voltage. In most of the wall rectifiers that we use so commonly, the rectification is a large signal rectification where the diode is essentially acting as a switch. In the forward cycle it turns on, in the reverse cycle it turns off and hence you get a net DC which is basically half sinusoids or you put a capacitor and you start getting smoothening in that signal. So the key parameters for diodes uh, are A, resistance and B, responsivity. Responsivity reflecting how much, it's, it's essentially the second derivative, how much is the nonlinearity in the diode. Uh, if you'd like to learn more, I would like to advertise uh, uh, this book that I edited with uh, my advisor at CU Boulder, Professor Garrett Modell. Uh, and uh, we have chapters from several uh, great researchers across the world uh, and I encourage you to look into it. So what's the operating range of this device and how is it used? Well, um, it has extensively been used for detection, uh, active and passive imagers and uh, you know that, that field is well established but then encroaching into the f f uh, space of infrared uh, energy and visible um, we see applications again there are detection applications but the one that we are most is interested in or I was most interested in was uh, energy harvesting both solar and thermal the waste heat uh, energy harvesting and really um, you know, people take the cue from the microwave rectennas have 90%, 80%, 90% efficiency. Oh, if, it would be great if we can do the same for, uh, for infrared or visible spectrum. But sadly, there hasn't been a demonstration of highly efficient rectennas in that range. Uh, the one that I know of, uh, we did a 0.01, or the company that I worked for during my PhD, uh, Fire Corporation did a 0.01% uh, demonstration of an IR detector at 10 micron, which is uh, using a carbon dioxide laser. Uh, so the concept has been around for a while, but uh, certainly no demonstration of repute. So let me kind of look at why that is the case. Why are we limited and, you know, what can we do to uh, improve the efficiency of what, what are the roadblocks. So first of all, we need a very fast diode that can respond at these frequencies. Uh, we need to have, have a low diode resistance so that we can have a good match to the antenna. Antenna resistances are typically in the range of 100 ohms, uh, although uh, they can be increased into thousands of ohms. Again, I'm not an antenna expert. A low capacitance um, to uh, prevent uh, shunting the diode. So this um, antenna to diode coupling uh, is kind of, uh, you know, is, is a coupled problem. And uh, if you imagine a parallel plate capacitor, the capacitance and the uh, resistance of that parallel plate capacitor are uh, have opposite scaling with area. Area increases, uh, resistance decreases, but uh, capacitance increases. So the RC time constant kind of remains the same. So it's it's uh, it, you can't just do an area scaling to change the uh, RC time constant of the circuit that we are dealing with here. We need high um, beta for rectification that will govern the efficiency uh, and, and we need a large voltage from the source. That can be in terms of higher intensity or it can be in terms of a clever design of the antenna which allows uh, a larger voltage and, and, and that will give higher efficiency. 
of, of course, we need efficient antennas for good collection. So on the first point of, of what the diode, what diode can we use for, uh, for rectennas, uh, the most common one that has been uh, investigated is the metal insulator metal diode. It, uh, the mechanism of rectification is tunneling, so it's uh, nonlinear, uh, it's femtosecond fast, although a lot of people will say that's, that's not really true. There is it may be 10 femtoseconds, so that has its own uh, frequency response range. And um, I, I just list a summary of work that I did. I did some fabrication uh, with sputtered materials, um, simulations, and uh, you know, try to modify these uh, diodes to make a transistor as well as put multiple insulators to design new barriers, new band structures here. So this is a metal insulator metal and you have tunneling across and you can imagine that you can play with this space of the insulator as well as play with the work function of these metals. So there's uh, a lot of research that has been done in that area and uh, I'd refer you to my thesis on that. Uh, what I will go into a little bit of depth is to try and explain what is the mechanism of rectification using this diode uh, when we are looking at really high frequencies. So let's start with a classical frequency, uh, a classical regime, low frequency. And um, well, how do we define classical? Well, low frequency would be uh, when, when this, uh, the uh, voltage, the AC voltage, the V omega cosine omega t that is applied across the diode, the V omega is much smaller uh, than the scale of the nonlinearity in the device. So for example, these barriers are on the range of a uh, few tenths of an EV and uh, the V omega is in the range of a milli, uh, millivolt. Uh, that, that would be uh, a small, uh, classical low, low frequency regime. So in that regime, uh, what, what the f kind of electron can be considered stationary and uh, with that small voltage we can imagine uh, that uh, we can, Im sorry, I, I think I said something wrong here. I, I, let, me, let me correct that. Uh, low frequency is, is where the H bar omega energy is, is is uh, you know smaller than uh, the the v omega the signal that is applied so this so this alpha term is small so in that in that regime we, we we say that the frequency is small the band structure is able to kind of follow the changes in the ac signal and 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 we uh, change the band structure according to the positive cycle of the oscillation or the negative cycle and you can see that by by doing so uh, we change the distance across which the electron has to tunnel through this barrier and, and that causes a nonlinearity in, uh, non in the IV curve and, uh, and, and an asymmetry in the amount of current that flows through in the negative versus positive cycle. Uh, when, we, when we go to the high frequency regime, uh, we have to invoke uh, the semi-classical theory where uh, the electron now absorbs a, a photon or emits a photon and can occur at a multiplicity of levels uh, which are spaced apart by h bar omega uh, relative to its original state. And um, this, this is a theory which is used in microwave uh, rectifiers, cooled microwave re rectifiers and uh, for uh, you know, it, it was established in 1963. What it basically says is that uh, because of this phenomena called photon stepping or photon assisted transport, uh, your illuminated IV curve can essentially be given in terms of the dark IV curve, uh, but add to the voltage, the energy of the photon, and, and you have to weight each of those IV curves uh, with, with this Bessel function term. So I'm, I'm going to simplify this uh, picture and just present uh, on uh, you know, one level instead of a multiplicity of levels. So what happens if we have one level? And that's the picture I present here. Uh, and 
you can see two different two two metals uh, spaced apart. There's a certain DC voltage that is developed across this insulator, uh, insulator given by V0. And um, if the H bar omega, the photon energy that is absorbed by the electrons is large enough, this uh, electron can tunnel across and reach the other side. When the, um, and, and that's the operating point at, at this location here uh, along the IV curve. When the, uh, the photon energy uh, equals the developed um, DC voltage, that's when you're at this point, that's kind of the maximum power point uh, for, for this uh, IV curve that I've drawn. And as you go beyond uh, in, in the DC voltage, such that the photon can no longer tunnel across, uh, you do not have any, any current flowing and hence no power generation. So this is kind of the ideal picture for a, a rectification in a metal insulator, metal tunnel diode. Of course, there are non-linearities. Of course, there are states even, even below the Fermi level. So this, that's going to soften the IV curve that you get. So just to get an estimate for what would be the efficiency of, uh, of rectification for solar radiation, uh, the person who followed up uh, with this work at CU Boulder, Samil Joshi, uh, did this simulation where he converted the frequency spectrum of the sun into a time domain signal and uh, applied that time domain signal to the rectification theory that I presented before. And what he gets is um, efficiency curve, which is in green, and an illuminated current voltage curve, which is in blue. Um, and one, one thing to kind of point out here is that this, this, this rectification happens in the second quadrant instead of in the fourth quadrant. Uh, but the maximum efficiency that he gets is 44% for, an ideal, um, for an ideal diode. So the, the parameters that he used in the simulation are kind of given here. Uh, one of the key things that governs how much power uh, is received is this uh, spatial coherence area, which is over what area of the Earth is the sunlight coherent. And that limits the size of collection of one antenna element. So the peak efficiency uh, that he gets is about 44%, which again matches with uh, what Shockley Quasar give as the ultimate efficiency limit, not the Shockley Quasar limit, but the ultimate efficiency limit, um, which is a little higher. So the question that arises in the field of rectennas is um, how high in efficiency can they go? Because again, as I started out mentioning, classical rectennas can go up to 90%. So wh why are these limited to 44%? Well, the theory kind of points to a similar efficiency limit as a classical uh, you know, semiconductor-based solar cell. And that's because, uh, again, your operating point is fixed in voltage. Even though you have a full spectrum coming in, you are operating at a one particular voltage. So all the photons. Um, that were above that voltage kind of have to go through an energy loss thermalization um, to kind of uh, be at that operating voltage. So can we exceed the 44% limit? Well, uh, the short answer is yes. Long answer is yes, but it's difficult. And the reason it's difficult is because we have to break, the, uh, break away from this quantum regime where uh, we, we are in, in a one photon process and get into a classical regime where the signal, the AC signal that is applied across the rectenna is large enough that there are multi-photon uh, processes happening in that, re uh, that regime. And again, it's a, you can find parallels to that with the semiconductor based solar cell uh, field uh, where, where you, if you have a multi-photon process, you can break the Shockley-Quasar limit. So um, 
to really get into the classical regime, you need to increase the diode voltage. And uh, there we can think of two ways to do that. One would be to increase the input intensity. The other way would be to uh, change the antenna design. So high radiation resistance basically means design the antenna so that it, it is able to supply a larger voltage at the diode. So here's a, a comparison of IV curves for the three different regimes that I've showed in the previous slide. Low intensity, uh, high frequency. And the frequency here, if you look at this IV curve, is essentially given by a tenth of an EV because that's the maximum voltage that is developed uh, by this solar cell. Now this is higher intensity and with that uh, we have multiple photon processes happening. So with the higher intensity you can see uh, that not only we have a ten, uh, ten, uh, tenth of an EV uh, photon step but also a twentieth of an EV photon step or two tenths of an EV photon step uh, and, and a three tenths. And as you increase the intensity further, you get into a very high intensity reg regime. This kind of curve extends further out and it kind of smoothens out. So even with uh, so uh, tenth of an EV photons with very high intensity uh, given here as 10 millivolts, you're able to get up to three volts in this curve. So kind of broken away from uh, the, the quantum regime which limited the uh, voltage uh, to, to be governed by the photon energy rather than uh, the intensity. So with this uh, kind of come to the conclusion for this section and uh, uh, thanks again to Sawmill for sharing his slides with me. Uh, but with the key takeaways here is that yes with monochromatic efficiency best case you can, you can get 100% but again that's a far stretch from where we are today. Uh, broadband efficiency maximum in the quantum regime is 44% if you split the spectrum into you know different antennas again kind of like a multi-junction process uh, you, you can go above 44%. Uh, if you are in a classical regime, uh, which can be done through various techniques, you can again go above 44% number um, and thereby kind of, you can exceed the shock equalizer limit, but then really the shock equalizer limit is not valid if you are doing tricks like that. Uh, nevertheless, there remain challenges towards, uh, you know, how much you can collect, what is the largest area you can collect with one element and that's given by the coherence and um, I don't think we have fully figured out the diode part yet. Uh, I think the RC time constant remains uh, a large challenge and uh, diode breakdown can also be challenging. With that I thank you and uh, if you find my work interesting would you like to contact me uh, please feel free to note down my email address. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, Sachin, and uh, quite a range of topics there. <laughs> so, um, so um, it's been very uh, careful to leave some time for questions. Um, yeah, when you say high illumination intensity, like how much concentration is that? So I would kind of go back to this slide where um, the higher range is 10 milliwatts and for one sun, it, you would be in tens of microwatts, so about a thousand sun uh, concentration would be needed to get into that regime. Hi. Uh, in the, you, said, you mentioned that uh, in the classical operating regime, you have a, a better chance of breaking the shock device limit. Uh, and, but I was wondering, wouldn't that uh, uh, limit more because of the coherence uh, issue that you have? Yes, I, I think that's true if you're looking in the f from the perspective of uh, uh, just, just uh, solar. But I think if you look at waste heat, uh, you can put the rectennas really close to the source of the waste heat. So the coherence range would be large and also depending on the, you know, uh, 
since you are so close, you get more power into the rectenna. So I, I agree that there are that those are two different uh, aspects, uh, but you can find situations where it works to the advantage. Okay, thanks. And a related question. You, you mentioned that the coherence and the area of the device or the size of the device is related. Isn't the thickness more important for coherence or is it just the area? Uh, thickness, of thickness of the device, uh, I mean the growth thickness. Well, so, so in, in this case, the collection for rectennas, the collection is governed by the antenna. So the antenna... So it's the size is size of the antenna. It's 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 the the area that the antenna projects on the source. Uh, yeah. Uh, looking back to the first part of your talk, um, the uh, extrapolation to uh, uh, zero uh, temperature for the um, um, VOC. Uh, that's a very nice technique uh, for looking at um, uh, the interface limited um, devices. What do you, do you say the relation is to um, uh, the approach used with several other hex junction devices of looking at the diagonal band gap as being the limit on the VOC? Um, is it a generalization of that type of approach? Um, so you're looking at uh, well, band well, with um, particularly with uh, organic solar cells, um, often the diagonal band gap, the uh, what is it, um, the homo on one material and the lumo on the other, the difference between those as being the limit of the VOC, which essentially is the same as having interface limited. Uh, um, BOC. Um, well, I'm wondering whether your approach is going to be a, a, a good way to generalise between um, those type of interface limited devices and um, uh, non-interface limited, or bulk limited devices. Um, right. So I, I, I'm not very familiar with the physics of uh, you know OPV, but but to just give get you thinking on the lines that I was thinking when I developed this, each uh, each each recombination process has has a thermal activation. So the bulk and the space charge are uh, thermally activated across the band gap. Whereas the interface, uh, due to the interaction of states at the interface with one of the bands, uh, the, the 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 energy across which the the thermal process happens, the thermal activation happens, is less than the band gap. And that's really the key to uh, this analysis. It's it's taking that in. So. I'm not sure if you can do the same with OPV. I think there's a very similar uh, approach that could be used. Uh, the same thing is also done with inorganic um, hex junctions as well, uh, sometimes, uh, because they often are limited by the, uh, the, the, the interfaces of pinned, or the, sorry, the, the band offsets are pinned. Um, uh, so essentially the same approach is often used, uh, but it doesn't have to be. It, it, as you say, it depends on the activation energies for those uh, different mm -hmm. rec recombination mechanisms. So right. I think it could be used, and uh, I think right. it would be very nice to try and do that. Right. I think to unify it between the, um, uh, there, There's a very big disconnect between the two approaches right. at the moment, so I think that would be very useful to do that. And ju just to add to that, you know, the, the, the real beauty for this lies in the fact that you're looking at a macroscopic variable like VOC, which you <laughs> measure every time, but now you're just digging into the physics based on that variable. So, yes. very much so empirically, the VOC uh, follows the diagonal band gap in a way, very wide range of hex junction devices. Uh, so, uh, experimentally, it is, uh, and but similarly, it's not very well understood exactly why. Um, uh, but it's empirically, it's a very strong result. So, yeah, I'd, I'd like to do that further. Sure, we can talk about that. In, uh, in your talk on the antenna, the last part on the antennas, <coughs> you uh, were really uh, focusing on the uh, uh, rectification process, diodes, which mm -hmm. is where you do most of your work. Um, are you aware of the state of the, the state of the art, I guess, in looking at tiny antennas, the antenna end of it, which, um, so the antennas are inherently uh, frequency dependent. Mm -hmm. So they're sort of tuned for a frequency, mm -hmm. not, and the, the, the optical, uh, the spread of frequencies in the optical bandwidth is very great mm -hmm. in the antenna since they're polarised. Uh, so they take one polarisation, not, not multi polarisation, unless you do a whole lot of work to, to, to just more than that. Um, and they have a, a, a resistance or a place. So they, um, there's lots of sort of antenna parameters that are not very well suited to incoherent broadband 
there was there was some progress. Um, I don't think there has been a lot of focus on it. Um, you know, things like uh, a spiral antenna can be can catch both polarization, or you can put two bow tie antennas across, or two two um, dipole antennas across from each other, so you get both polarizations. Again, these are more you know tricks on paper rather than actual implementations, and and I, I think there are more fundamental issues that are being that need to be addressed before you reach to a stage where antenna design becomes a limitation. Um, people have have proposed. There was one. Um, I forget. There's there's a chapter in the book as well, uh, but there's there's a group uh, at a national lab. Um, I forget the name of the national lab in the U.S. where they kind of printed antennas on a large sheet, like a meter square or something, and 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 that, that's that's like uh, the scale of of uh, the device that needs to be done for energy harvesting. So there is work towards that end. Can I ask a question along similar lines, actually? Um, I think the area of coherence is something like 100 microns squared, something like that, isn't it? I think I had 19 microns, but it depends oh, no. on how def you, you define the coherence, uh, you know, 80% well, coherence. So that's what I was kind of getting onto, actually, that, uh, how you define it. Uh, is it um, uh, wavelength dependent, uh, the, the, um, the size of the coherent uh, um, area? Uh, um, I would have to go back and look exactly what that is because, you know, if if it were, then how can you define one number for solar radiation? Well, that's what I was wondering. Yeah, this is white light coherence. Yeah, this is oh. this is more like white light coherence. I'm not sure what. Uh, exactly. Actually, getting interference ranges from white light. Yeah, yeah. Oh, right. Okay. All right. Oh, well, because uh, I was wondering whether, um, because there's a, uh, a chromatic aberration that applies to. Um, 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 antennas uh, used for uh, radio reception and the like, which uh, should uh, extend into the visible region, but there isn't any chromatic aberration on the size of um, uh, collectors or um, uh, photovoltaic uh, um, um, devices. Uh, and I, I've often wondered whether to uh, match those two things together is to do with the, the area of coherence uh, and whether that's um, wavelength dependent. Um, but if this is a white light coherence, is that a, an average in some way, or a, um, 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 a superposition of all the different coherences of the different uh, wavelengths? I think I think it is to some extent that because the all, all the incoherencies as the light travels, they cancel out, and you know, what you get is somewhat coherent. It's coherence because it's not a, a infinite width uh, of, uh, of all the wavelengths. It's, right. a, it's a certain small wavelength. Right. Yeah. Right. Okay. Okay, so it's still, it could be, so that could be the reason you see this dramatic aberration of radio wavelengths, but not in uh, visible ones. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Interesting. Um, we probably need to be out by that. Oh, sorry, one more. Oh, no. okay. sorry. I got a question. Well, you simulated an uh, uh, interface uh, recombination in the CRGS solo cell. But did you simulate the uh, recombination uh, across the interface? across the Cadmus Alpha and the CRGS? Uh, it was... Like the electrons in the CDS and the holes in the uh, CRGS. No, I don't know. It wasn't across. It, the, first of all, it was experimentally extracted. It, I did not simulate it, but, but I think the, the experiment was accounting for whatever was happening at that uh, junction, irrespective of where the carriers were coming from. Basically, again, going back to the argument, whatever that thermal activation energy was for the process. Okay, well, I hope we've provoked lots of uh, lots of questions you'll think about, um, and maybe contact such it about by email. Um, and uh, perhaps if we could thank you, and um, and thanks very much for the visit. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.